Now we actually finished studying the Lord in the garden. I can't get that out. And, uh, but, but there was, I, I said to you, and, and I actually gave you two, that just looking at the Lord in the garden and his suffering and then his resolve, uh, that there were four great lessons on how we should handle a conflict in life that when we're torn and maybe even tormented, uh, when darkness sets in, when there's either pain or suffering and we can't think we can handle what's ahead. I, th I think of the Apostle Paul, he talks about being in, uh, oh, how's he, he, re he, re he relates that in several different ways. Let's see if I can see that. I was almost quoted the verse. Um, Anyhow, it's where he talks about being persecuted but not cast down and uh, something but not in despair. I can't remember what the thing was, but that he's not in despair. What a way to start. Forget it. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, in fact, some of the lessons, all the lessons that I see in the Lord are actually taught by the Apostle Paul. But, uh, but it's important that as we, as we look at this and see how the Lord... Uh, resolved the issue, the conflict of going to the cross, uh, that we learned how to resolve the same kind of conflicts. So let me just read. I'm going to just pick up in verse 38, uh, and just, and then we'll go over the the two that I mentioned and the last two that we never got to. Second Corinthians 4:8 what you were talking. About. Okay, I'm past that now. <laughs> I was looking. Second Corinthians 4. Okay, uh, it says in verse 38, "Watch ye, uh, watch ye, and pray." Lest ye enter into temptation, the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. And, uh, and he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Arise and let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand, and immediately while he spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, uh, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and scribes and elders. So the Lord resolves that, and, and what we pointed out, the way we studied that whole section, is we realized that man is a triune being, and we saw how his body was physically weak, that his soul was exceeding sorrowful unto death, but his resolve was, not my will, but thy will be done. That, that is a spiritual decision. And we said when you're in any kind of conflict, turmoil, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you don't know what to do, then one thing you can just determine to do is just do God's will, whatever the cost. Just, just resolve that you don't have to figure out what to do. Did you ever realize that, that that was the very sin that Eve was deceived by? Adam, uh, Satan comes to Eve and tempts her and denies what God said. He said, you shall not surely die. And all of a sudden she's in conflict. Well, do I believe him or do I believe God? Should I not eat? Should I? The, the conflict would have been resolved if she would have just walked in faith and said, no, not my will, but thy will be done. God said it and I'm just going to trust God. But that's actually the second. The first is to resolve all matters on a spiritual, not your will but God's will. The second is you do that by walking by faith. And you believe God's word. You certainly trust in God's character. That's what Eve, that's Satan got Eve to doubt the goodness of God. That he didn't want what's best for her. So uh, you can resolve a conflict not only to determine to do spiritually right, but walk by faith, trust God's word, his character, his will, and look forward in the hope that he gave us that, that no matter what happens in life, even if it brought your physical death, nothing's going to separate you from the love of God and that uh, all things work together for good to them that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So that hope uh, would sustain you. In fact, we looked at Romans about how you're saved by hope. So let me show you how the Lord did that. Come to Hebrews chapter 2. I don't know if I showed you this verse last time. <clears throat> oh, it's Hebrews 12 verse 2. That's the verse. And this is the same conflict the Lord faced in the garden. Certainly anybody going through the tribulation. Now you go through tribulation, but there's going to be the tribulation as we like to call it. And... Uh, 
And the book of Hebrews is written to those who will face that tribulation and then use the Lord Jesus Christ as an example of someone who endured that tribulation because they're going to have to endure unto then. And so in Hebrews 12 and verse 2 it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand uh, of the throne of God. So how did Jesus Christ overcome the conflict? Well, he, he did despise uh, the shame of the cross, but he endured the cross, it, was, it says, for the joy that was set before him, knowing that what was ahead, beyond the cross, and that's actually beyond the resurrection, when he finally is exalted and, and, and everything turns out the way that God has planned for it to turn out, he looked to that point, and that gave him what he needed to do to endure the situation. So that, those are the first two things. The third is right there in Mark, Mark chapter 14, the reason I began in verse 38. It says, watch ye and pray. Well, there's your answer. It, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And so the way that you would endure such a hardship or darkness in your life is that you would watch... That's a spiritually look out uh, and pray. And, uh, and, and it's that, that's where prayer, that everyone always talks about, oh, I don't know how to pray. And don't let anybody, even if you never can figure out how to pray, don't ever let anyone ever stop you from praying. I mean, there's just power in the very fact that you're communicating with God. You're bringing God into the situation and you're, you're seeking his wills. You, even if you know his will, then you're seeking his strength. And there comes that peace that passes all understanding. So you need to resolve the situation by watching and praying. So that is keep your eyes open while you pray too. Huh? <laughs> Not just close your eyes to the situation, but watch and pray. And uh, lest ye enter into temptation. And, and the warning that the Lord has given right here, the sleeping apostles, every time he comes back they're asleep. Well, they did enter into temptation, didn't they? When, when the enemy came, they fled. They weren't ready because they didn't do what the Lord told them to do. They didn't watch and pray. Uh, verse 40, it says, And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. So uh, they weren't watching and praying as he told them to do. And they did enter into temptation and fail in that temptation. But the answer to not failing is to watch and pray and then resolve something ahead of time, even right now. Before that darkness comes, the other re resolutions we talked about, but in your matter of praying, especially if you're asking God for something, then just take the same resolve that the Lord Jesus Christ took and the Apostle Paul took, and that is take the matter three times to the Lord and then just settle it right there. It's amazing. The Lord did it. Three times he went and prayed. Same thing. And then he gets up and says, let's go. The hour's here. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul had an infirmity in the flesh. Three times he prayed unto the Lord about it. And then God's answer, my grace is sufficient for thee. And that's what you need to do. Is after three times of just carrying it to the Lord, just get to the resolve that God's grace is sufficient for you. No matter what the situation is. And, and then get up and move on. And... Uh, so anyhow, the pattern is set. Three in your Bible is going to come up in our study in the book of Acts. It just comes up all the time. We're going to start studying Cornelius. And Peter has a vision. He sees it three times. There's three different ways God communicates to Peter to let him know what his will is, what his word is. So three in your Bible certainly represents God, but it also represents a resolution of God's, uh, of God's will and way and, and, uh, and, and should become our resolve. And, and so we should learn from that. Uh, and so that was the third thing, watch and pray. And then the fourth way to go through conflict is surrender yourself unto God as a living sacrifice. Now that, you know, all of us, you know, that's, we can preach that. <laughs> I can preach it to you. But when it comes time to sacrifice, <laughs> you know, nobody likes to sacrifice, especially a sacrifice unto death. But no matter, we, we all want to have our way and do our thing, and, and, uh, and, and we all want to follow the Lord and serve the Lord unless it's a sacrifice. <laughs> then we don't want to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's Romans 12. Uh, go, to, go to Romans 12 because there's another passage right there.
there, there's a, a truth that you need to know in your mind, and that is spiritual victory always comes through death. Isn't that what the Lord's going to experience? Isn't that our salvation? The resolution is, 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 is death. The, the victory comes through spiritual death, through dying to self and uh, and the Lord, not just spiritual in the not just in the spiritual sense, but it, the spiritual victory comes through you dying, whether it's a, a living sacrifice or if it happens to be a physical sacrifice. The victory comes there. And Romans twelve one says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world." But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you become a living sacrifice. You just resolve the fact that, that come what may, you're going to die to self and, uh, and, and, and let God's will be done. And that brings victory um, in, in any situation. People, when you get to the end of your, you know, like we're always trying to solve our own problem. And there's a sense in which you are to bear your own burden, and, uh, but, but you need to solve it God's way. But you get to a point in life where there's some things you just can't, you can't resolve. You can't change somebody else. You can't even control your own dest your, your destiny, yes, but your own uh, physical destiny in the sense if you get a cancer or something like that and you face physical death, you might try to resolve that through medical, but you might not have choices after a while. But you might even have choices along the way, whether you want to go that route or not. Anyhow, the whole thing is, is eventually you just let go and put it in the hands of God, whether you let go and go through a surgery or something, or you let go and say, no, just it, it's time for me just to resolve the situation and just let it go. But, but more in, in the personal matter, those who have gone through divorce and have struggled and fought because everyone, you got two sides manipulating, trying to get their way and neither one can control each other, and the courts step in, and they do something else, and, and you're really at the end of yourself. And the resolution is just go ahead and die, because victory comes through death. Look at Romans 6. Now, it doesn't mean stop fighting for what's right, but, but victory, when you get to the end of your rope, when you get to the end of yourself, then there's just God, and that's enough. That's when you learn His grace is sufficient. Romans chapter 6, and this is where we're talking about our baptism into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and the, the practical truth that's there in that. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is free from sin. Well, that's one way to resolve a problem, isn't it? To die to it. Now, sometimes our flesh keeps trying to remind ourselves that it's alive, Remind us that it's a lie, but in, in verse 11 it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. <laughs> Adds that indeed under in there. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and so as you go through Romans 6, and Romans 6, 7, and 8 is spiritual victory in your life. It starts out dying, and then 7 is buried and then chapter 8 is the newness of life you have in the Spirit of God. And, uh, and, but it starts, victory starts with dying. And, and so that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, he resolved, prayed it three times, now he's willing to face death. And he gets up from where he's at. So back Mark chapter 14. Now when we've studied this, we've, we've been comparing different verses, and we saw that in the Gospel of John, this whole incident in the garden, he enters the garden, but you don't see all this praying and all go, taking place in the book of John. And the reason it's there is John is not showing the life of Jesus Christ as Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. He look, John is showing Jesus Christ in his divine nature. And so there's no human resolve to go on. There's no body that's weak and a soul that's exceedingly sorrowful. You just see the Lord Jesus Christ looking at the cross and say, For this reason I came into the world. No man takes my life. I lay it down. And he just goes, goes for the cross. And, and that's because John is showing that divine nature. I say that to you because look at uh, verse 38 of Mark 14. It says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now stop looking and look up at me. When the Lord says, the spirit truly is ready, how do you finish that? 
Okay, yeah, I, I shouldn't have said the first part. <laughs> I always do things backwards. <laughs> you, you, the flesh is weak, you're all right, but that's not the thing that's different, it's the first part. In Mark it says, the spirit truly is ready. Do you know what it says in Matthew and Luke? He said that the spirit truly is willing. Mark says that he said that the, tr the spirit truly is ready. And so... How do you resolve that? Well, the Lord must have said both. That his spirit is willing and ready. And, uh, and certainly that's where we need to be. But, but I wondered to myself, because when things are different like that, they're that, that way for a different. Remember that, uh, for a reason, that Mark is uh, writing and showing Jesus Christ, and he's showing the servitude of the Lord Jesus Christ as the servant of Jehovah. You know what a servant is? A servant's ready. Now think about Matthew. What, how does Matthew portray Jesus Christ? As a king. You know, for a king to resolve to die, he has to be willing. Not just ready. A, a servant is ready. A king is willing. Then think of Luke. Luke says willing. And, and why would Luke say willing? Well, how does Luke portray the Lord Jesus Christ? As a man, he look, he's the doctor. He's looking at the physical person of Jesus Christ and sees him as the son of man. And a man, God created man with free will. And the resolve of man is to do the will of God, not my will, but thy will be done. And so he also says the spirit truly is willing. And Mark would have been different because of the nature in which Mark shows the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing all the different details that are in here. We get down to verse 42, and, and uh, we've, we've read these verses several times. It, the third time they're asleep, and he says, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. And then he says in verse 42 of Mark 14, Arise, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately, <laughs> when we were studying at hand in 1 Thessalonians, I, I, I saw this passage, and I, some people still don't think at hand can mean right now. <laughs> but anyhow, that's a different story. Uh, but the point is, is that when he was done, when he got up from prayer and he said, Arise, let us go. He, uh, he that betrayeth me is at hand. There's a band walking up to him as he's saying that. And it says, And immediately while he, was yet, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now, do you remember what time of night this is? We've been kind of estimating, just realizing all the different events that took place that day as we've been studying Mark chapter 14. And we know that, uh, studying that cock crowing, that, that he, you're past midnight hour. And the, there's going to be a, a cock crowing that's going to take place perhaps... Uh, Anyhow, real soon, and then, and then two more later on. Uh, perhaps one already took place. But the point is, is you're past midnight. You're in the early hours of the, of the morning as we look at it. And, and these people are coming in at night to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. And beginning in verse 43, the way I outline this, through 52, uh, I called it uh, betrayal upon his arrest. Everything, in, as I divided up Mark chapter 14, centers around one form or another of his betrayal. Judas betrayed him, uh, and then, uh, um, I forget how we just studied the other one, but this one, he, he's betray the betrayal upon his rest, arrest. When you go through these verses, he's first betrayed by a kiss, then he's going to be betrayed by all fleeing, then he's going to be betrayed by a young man. Only Mark points this one out. And, uh, and so this is the betrayal that's centered around his arrest. And certainly they're coming to arrest him. And Judas is going to come. And then it says, uh, verse 44, And he that betrayed him hath given, him a, given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. So... Judas is going to come and first betray the Lord Jesus Christ with a kiss. When it mentions Judas in verse 43, it says, Immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve. Now, the Bible does, because they didn't have last names, the Bible always gives like a son of or something to identify which one they're talking about. But it's interesting that he points out Judas and immediately says one of the twelve. Because certainly that's an identifier that he's one of the inner circle. 
He was one that was with the Lord the whole time the Lord was ministering. He was what Matthew 7 verse 15 calls a wolf in sheep's clothing. He looked just like one of the faithful apostles, but then here comes Judas, one of the twelve, and he's going to betray him with a kiss. So there's a warning right from in here that, you know, we like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. You can watch the preachers on TV or you can go around the community and to the different preachers and say, well, they're doing their best, their heart's really right, they just don't have correct doctrine in many cases. Hey, the Bible don't teach you to think that way. The Bible warns you. It warned, it warned especially back in Matthew chapter 5, beware of wolves in sheep clothing, and the Lord identifies them as false prophets, and you shall know them by their fruits. They're not teaching God's word. That's a good identifier. Here, within the 12 apostles, is a wolf that's not going to spare the flock. And, and so the Bible warns that over and over again about false prophets, false apostles, false ministers, as the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and talks about how Satan himself appears as an angel of light and even so his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. So there's a warning in the Bible of, of the infiltration that takes place in the believing remnant of Israel and, and you can make a study of that because not only did the Lord warn them of that in his ministry and right there one of the twelve was one of them, but that's important for when they go through that tribulation, there's going to be infiltrating their believing remnant, some false teachers, to either turn them in or to turn them away from the truth. And so it's a real strong warning, and the Apostle Paul gives that warning all the time. We're not like many who corrupt the Word of God. He says, uh, he talks about how there's many whose God is their belly. The Apostle Paul don't use small words, he uses big words like many to warn of the false teachers, and, and so you need to be warned uh, of that, and, and certainly that's the uh, statement there, Judas, one of the twelve. Um, so anyhow, Judas comes, and then he betrays him with that kiss. The, the people that's there, uh, in verse 44, it says, And he that betrayeth him had given him the token on whomsoever I shall kiss. No, I missed, it's the end of verse 43. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and scribes and elders. Hold your place here. Come to John chapter 18. This is not the reason I'm turning here. A lot of times you get thinking, and I don't know if it was planted in my head, but I had already thought that this was a band of Roman soldiers coming to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden. But it's not. It's a force sent by the chief priests and the, and the scribes of the temple to go and rest. They are a mob. They have authority by the chief priests, but they're, they're not Roman soldiers that are coming to arrest him. Uh, in, in John chapter 18, in verse 3, it says, And Judas then, having received a band of men and officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh hither with lanterns and torture, torches and weapons... <laughs> So they, they do have swords and knives and they're carrying lamp, lanterns and, you know, that's a reminder of the, the lateness of the night, torches, torches and, and several different kind of weapons. But this is, this is a mob that's, that's under the influence of the chief priests and the Pharisees and they're coming to Jesus Christ to arrest him by night and then uh, um, and, and haul him away. Now when they come, verse 4 says, Jesus therefore, I'm still in John, 18.4, Jesus therefore knowing all things that he should come unto him, all things that should come unto him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayeth him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now the reason that happened is, you put the cross references down, Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11. You'll be able to look at them next hour because we'll be going to 40, 43. But even John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. He's claiming to be Jehovah of the Old Testament, the I am. And when they say, he says, whom seek ye? And he says, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. The power of who he was knocked him flat cold. 
right out, right down. It must have looked like a domino effect, huh? Judas standing right there with them, the, the Bible points out. And he says, they, you know, I, I was thinking, how, would you arrest somebody that if he says, I am he, and it knocks you down just by saying that? The, the only thing they could have been thinking of is Judas stumbled and everybody fell back into each other and knocked all, everybody down like dominoes. Uh, bec- other than that, but uh, so then they start over again. Verse 7, he asked them again, whom seek ye? <laughs> and they said unto him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, and to- uh, I have told you, I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. And so he's, he's going to protect the apostles that are, that are faithful with him. Uh, but the, uh, and so he's going to just be arrested himself. They're eventually going to flee. But he, he defends them and sends uh, them away. Now, the apostles are going to flee and then he's going to be arrested. I don't know if we'll get back to John again in, in a moment. But there's something else. I want to talk to you about that kiss. Um, when Judas came and kissed him, Matthew 26, verse 5, you can just write it down, we don't have time to turn there. When he did that, it says that Jesus said to Judas, friend, uh, uh, wherefore art thou come? He called him friend. Now you also need to write down, uh, I'm going to read it to you, Psalms 41, verse 9. Because when he called him friend, it's because it's a fulfillment of this psalm. Judas was in the inner circle there, and the Lord gave him every benefit of being a friend. Psalms 41, verse 9, listen to this. It says, Yea, my own familiar friend, whom I have trusted, which did eat my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So when Judas kissed him, the Lord says, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Well, the Lord knew, and, uh, and he knew what was, was being fulfilled. Judas is that friend that betrayed him. Luke 22, verse 8, Jesus said, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And that's with a question mark. Now, you know, a kiss, we're supposed to greet one another with a holy kiss. I now understand why it says holy. Because there could be a lot of falseness in kisses. The first falseness could be just a fleshly thing. Got to be careful of that. But there could be a lot of, you just want someone to think you're close, keep your enemies close, the idea. So you, 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 you greet them with a kiss, but it's not a holy kiss. This certainly was no holy kiss. And, uh, and so it's, it's a kiss of betrayal. You know, the first time the word kiss shows up in your Bible, it's when Jacob, um, Jacob is deceiving um, Isaac, saying that he is Esau. And when his dad can't figure it out, he said, kiss me, my son. And so he kissed him. He smelled, but they put rabbit fur all over him, so he smelled wild. And he said, boy, your voice betrayeth you, but you smell like Esau. He was betrayed with a kiss right from the beginning. <laughs> there's, a, there's a passage. I've got to close with this. Go, go to Hosea chapter 13. But there's a passage where uh, in 2 Samuel 20, go to Hosea 13. 2 Samuel 20, though, that Hosea is the book after Daniel. Hosea, or, or in, in, in 2 Samuel, Joab is going to kill, used to be the captain of, of, of um, uh, Absalom's army when he tried to overthrow David. But after the overthrow, David made him part of his army, but Joab didn't ever accept that. And so he, it says he went in unto him, grabbed him by the beard with his right hand, pulled him forward and kissed him, and then with his put a dagger in him. Boy, be careful about a kiss, huh? <laughs> I know Joab's left-handed. Grabbed him, it says with his right hand, so the only hand that's free is his left hand, put a dagger in him. But uh, didn't let him go, he grabbed him by that beard. But look at Hosea chapter 13. It says in verse 1, it says, When Ephraim spake trembling, so he is humbled, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. So there's a rebellion. Ephraim represents the ten northern tribes that went into idolatry, worshiping idols. Verse 2, and now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of silver and idols according to their own understanding, all, the, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say, they say of them, 
Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. You talk about betrayal with a kiss. Be careful of a religious kiss. And you see that in all religions, bowing down, kissing statues. It all goes back here to idolatry. If you kiss a statue, you betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you see that going, whether it's kissing a ring, kissing a statue. It's idolatry. It's all according to their own understanding. And uh, by the way, well, I'd look at verse 4. It's for next hour. Yet I am the Lord thy God, from the land of Egypt thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. Just threw that in for next hour. Let's pray. <laughs> our God and our Father, we thank you for the study of your word and how intertwined all the thoughts are and doctrines of your Bible. The warning of being deceived, warning of, of false apostles, prophets, ministers, warning of even being betrayed by a kiss. And uh, Father, help us to be cautious that we don't get so tied up in our own thinking that we don't betray you with false doctrine and uh, idolatry and kissing in a religious sense. And thank you for these warnings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.